Hi, it's Chris Watkin. And in my series of talking to self-employed estate agents, I'm with Simon Hawksley, who's been a self-employed agent for 34 years. That's right, Chris, yeah. So when did you become an estate agent then? 1984. 1984. Who yeah. was that with then? Well, uh, the Brandless Taylors, which is a part of the Countrywide group. We would have been Hamburg at that time, wouldn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. yeah. Hold on a second. Rainbow Countrywide. You yeah. were, but they're, they're, they're employed, aren't they? Well, they are now, but back in the day, back in the 80s, um, capitalism was the big story, and you got the choice through tailors to actually work through a retainer system. So as a retainer, you'd choose what your survival rate was per month while you're just getting off the ground, whatever that figure may be. Um, and so back in the 80s, it was probably give me 300 quid a month or something. And then over that first quarter, when your sales started coming through, they'd say, well, we've, we've loaned you, you yeah. know, 1,200 quid or whatever it may be. Your commissions would come in and they'd say, right, from your commissions, how much of that do you want to now pay us back on this loan? But over the course of four quarters that year, by the end of the year, if you were half reasonable, you'd have actually been debt free with that particular agency. And then moving on to the next year, you just commission only, commission only, commission only. So you're telling me that Countrywide or whatever it was yeah. called then, were actually at, this is this pains me to say this, and mm. I've got shares in Countrywide. Oh dear. Okay, well, there you go. We're ahead of the game. They were 30 years ahead of the game. Robert Scarf, Bob Scarf was ahead of the game at the time. Oh, I interviewed, he's a wonderful man. He's a fantastic guy. Yeah, yeah. And, and ironically, 34 years later, you know, we're still... We still communicate, and um, but had him you, on the Watkins sofa a couple of months ago. Well, if, love if, him. Yeah. So if you look at Bob, Bob at the time. Was, Hold on, that means you'd have worked with Betty Shaw Newman then, when he had that awful hairstyle. He had his mullet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he had a mullet. He had the shoulder pads. He had the Porsche to go with it. He 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 looked like something out of. Um, My advice. Yeah, 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 Chubbs and Crockett, and yes, and he was one of those two. Yeah, going he, down the river yeah, in front he, of me. He was living the dream then, so Sean and I worked out the same office, um, he's a little bit younger than me, um, so he was really, really, as it were, fresh out of school, and the guy had got so much ambition, it was untrue. So if you look at the, the Sean Newman today to the Sean Newman from the past, it's the same, per he actually hasn't changed that much at Still all. Still wears trainers and got no fashion sense. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the, the, the only thing that's gone is the mullet. And the shoulder pads. Yeah, but he still has a full head of hair, so who am yeah. I to, um, to, to differ? But uh, the, the model that Sean, for example, runs as a self-employed person is born from those elements. And the, the, if you actually look at that model from 1984 through to 1989, 1989, the world changed for property because obviously we had crash. our first big crash. Yeah, yeah, these youngsters think this last one was the last so, Yeah, I think the Lehman Brothers in 2008 was anomaly, but it absolutely wasn't. It's cyclic. And if you look at 1989, significantly in 1989, that was worse than 2008 because in 1989, there was no bank bailout. And there was no Mark Carney turning around and saying, right, let's make the Bank of England's base rate half a percent or anything like that. So in 1989, the biggest differentiator then was that you not only got spiralling deflation, but also the mortgage rates went up to 14, 15, mm. 16 percent. So this double whammy was nobody wanted to borrow any money, but everybody's getting repossessed, repossessed left, right and centre. So when you, when you look at it in that context, it's hideous. 2008 became a buyer's market if you could source finance. And 2000, and, uh, sorry, 1989 wasn't a buyer's market and it certainly wasn't a seller's market either. So to go through that level of pain, the one thing that it did do at the time is it brought employment into the fold for people like Countrywide because nobody had an appetite to be self-employed because nobody would dare back, their, back themselves in that sort of condition. So for me, and people like Sean, who have got, we're not risk averse, and we've got a great deal of self-belief and faith in how we conduct ourselves, that we, we could plough through that, it made no difference. But as a point of recruitment, if you're not prepared to back yourself, you have to dare to ask why an employer would back you too. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that becomes quite significant. 
So did you stay with Countrywide after 89? Well, no, 89 was pivotal for me because um, I'd got young kids and I'd got fixed disciplines that I had to meet. So I jumped over the fence to legal in general at the time as a field sales executive and just ran a team of 15. And then we stayed in property, but it looked at commercial borrowing for mortgages, residential mortgages, less so. But I, I, I focused very much on commercial property through finance and uh, just kept some skin in the game at that end. And by 1992, that's when opportunity arose. So uh, Maverick Global, my company at that time, which is still going now, uh, became more property developers. So we were actually picking like carrion off corpses, other people's problems, and we were developing those through, but mainly commercial. Okay, so how long did you stop with Maverick? I know you still got it going, but what, what, how long were you with in the property development game with Maverick before you decided to go back into a state agency? Okay, so the, jo the journey is exactly the same. So if you look at 1989, 1989 for me was significant for the kids. Um, and by the time when the kids came out of university, and it was ob obvious that they were going straight from London, they weren't coming home, uh, my wife just turned around and said, right, stop getting bored at home, get back onto the cold face. Um, and the one thing that I can say is we, I love property, absolutely love property and I'm good at it. So it made common sense once the kids were through to stop doing what I was doing and look back at the industry. Now, what's critical for me was from 1989 moving forward, if I was to come back into this environment, I've suddenly created this massive work-life balance for myself where I'm so used to not doing a job that took me to the coalface on Saturdays yeah. because I was a touchline parent watching kids playing hockey, playing rugby, playing netball, playing whatever the sport they're doing. And I wanted to maintain that thing. So this, this idea of coming into back into the world of the state agency as an employee, if that meant that that gave me those restricted hours that I've suddenly become so used to not having, it was never gonna work for me. So I needed to find a solution for me that still allowed me to back myself but it gave me the flexibility that I'd enjoyed since 1989. So it had to be a self-employed route so I could govern yeah. those hours. And when was when did you make that move? Um, I came back in in 2017, 2018. Okay. And you joined the, the Find the Country Gang in? I joined, in well, actually, I, I just got in touch with Sean because Sean and I are climbing partners and um, we were going to Everest. With the head of... The <laughs> not this time round, no. So in, in more modern times. Did you know? Because I mean, he started his self-employed model in 07, 08, didn't he? Yeah. Um, sorry, when when the credit crunch, which you must have been one of the first to do it. What? Yeah. What? yeah. One so, of the first. So in yeah, 2000. During that credit crunch, Sean has to make a decision on his fixed and his direct and his indirect outgoings. So for Sean that's much of a, a, a business matter mm -hmm. as anything. So if you've got a payroll run and PAYE and sick pay and paid for holidays and stuff like that, and on a huge workforce that you couldn't absolutely guarantee can actually get stock over the line, you've got to make a d decision. So the adversity probably created the situation in 2007, 2008 for Sean. However, you now, now move that process forward 15 years and say, right, where are we today for the associate it makes so much sense but not every associate okay so you joined the new you, you just, sean's got two brands the newman's and the finer country yeah um and the easy property at the time and easy property you chose the finer country route because no no, no. Well, so when sean and i went climbing uh, easy property finer country just created this easy property thing and they were very keen to see if they could actually have a hybrid arm to their um Okay. Up a tier thing. So I came in as the regional sales director for Easy Property for a year. How did that go? Um, it was a really interesting experience and I learned so much. And um, obviously, you know Adam Day very well. So Adam and I were on the phone, you know, a couple of times a week. And I think he's an absolutely smashing mm -hmm. guy. I've got a lot of time for him. Um, he helped me. But over the course of the year, um, the one thing that I did learn is that the online hybrid agents, the actual agents themselves, are um, the perception from the public understates their ability, for starters. Um, their cost per transaction 
means that they go bust. So I've got a sales force of plus 20 agents at any given time, and over the course of that 12 months, they left for the wrong reasons. They left because they ran out of money trying. And if you look at the way that that transactional cost works, when you're charging peanuts, but you're expecting like a fine country service, the two ends don't mm -hmm. meet. So all I've got was a bunch of very busy fools earning something close to nothing. Um, that were really, really experienced agents, and they're very, very well-meaning, but the, it was actually the product cost yep. that prevented them going on. Unless they'd got monstrous market share, it was never going to work in their favour. So um, it got to the end of that year. My report then went back into um, Sean and Fine Country to say, this isn't for me, but I don't, don't actually think there's an industry model to be had unless something radically changes as to how you look at that transactional route. Um, and then Sean said, what do you want to do now? And I said, I don't know, I'll go back to where I was, I guess. And he said, well, why don't you jump over to find a country? So this was, what, early? So that was 2019. January, so I think. Yeah, so, well, January 2019 to June 2019, I still had a duty of care, so any easy property client from North London right up to Staffordshire that was still on the books, um, because the, the public can't be the, the, the eventual fall guy yep. for my decision. So I still chaperone those people over the line once they were over the line. So that takes you through to June. Then from June to the end of the year, it was just wholly fine and country. So there was a, ha there was, there was a halfway house um, while I was shepherding at one stage in fine and country. So which part of the country do you focus your attention now with your fine and country branch? With fine and country, I'm slightly allied to the rugby branch office. So if you looked at their geographic area, you'd say that's the patch that I predominantly deal with. But I'm also, at the moment, very much developing uh, buyer journeys. So I, I brokered a property in York um, okay. during December. Um, um, I was talking to a guy in Scotland um, the other day. So you're both a buyer's so, agent and a normal seller's yeah. estate agent. Um, you have a certain style and flair with regard to the way you uh, present yourself, the way you present properties. Has Have you been curtailed back? Because let's be frank, if you were anywhere else, I think you would have been curtailed, especially with a corporate with this flamboyance with regard to the way you market and portray yourself? To be honest, no. Um, I haven't been curtailed at all. Um, but significantly, if you're self-employed, self-employed is a double status. It's a tax status only. It makes no difference. You'd be a branch manager and be self-employed. It's just a tax status. But it's also a state of mind. And that state of mind for me means that I look at myself as freelance, but I also look at how vital it is for me to build a brand around myself. So if you want to try and create your own individual identity, mm -hmm. then somewhere along the line you've got to stand out from the crowd and find out what that USP is. So my USP is on many different levels. Because it's not just the final country brand, because someone could do what you do yeah. without the final country brand. Oh, absolutely. 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 Um, and the thing that's most significant is that if there's an estate agent that's watching this and they're thinking, what do I do? The first thing that they've got to do is actually look at the ship that they're sailing in at the moment. So if, as an employee or self-employed, if they are curtailed and mm -hmm. said, right, okay, fine, it doesn't matter about the tax status, but this is what that process looks like. If that process doesn't suit, then question whether you're the right person. When you're working alongside these guys, or the people that I work alongside, they're saying your own brand identity is absolutely essential. As important as the, almost, it's, it's more you. Important. It's you, you've just got a code of credibility with a fine and country brand. Yeah, exactly that. And um, the way that I look at fine and country, fine and country is not an estate agent. It is absolutely not an estate agent. Fine and country is simply a marketing outlet. It is a brand. It's a, it's a point of marketing. I am an estate agent. They are a marketing tool for me. Now, when you do your videos, which again have a certain panache and style, yeah. is that you trying to be different or is that you as a person? I think it's both. And I think the, um, there are, I've got contacts and connections and in my Maverick Global journeys, I, I had the, you know, the great fortune to be able to observe how TV 
production goes and, and how they do what they do. And all I've tried to do is simulate that and say, well, OK, there is a very, very strict and stringent process that these guys use to put little shows together. Um, so I thought, well, if I can use that, and then as long as each storytelling uh, is slightly different, then there's an audience appetite. It doesn't come across samey. So one thing I do notice with the industry in general is at the moment it is tripod, iPhone, house for sale in the background, narration at the front. At least they're doing it. They're doing it, which is great. Because not many people are yeah. doing it. Those who are doing it do, can have the capacity. If they've got the confidence to get in front of the camera. Which is the big one. Which is the big one. Once they're over that hurdle, the next thing they need to do really, I think, is look at TV adverts and say, right, okay, how do you get the best out of 30 seconds? You're absolutely right. And, you know, just so when you do start doing your videos, guys and girls, learn and, and what you end up doing is watching the TV with sound off to see where they pan the shots. Yeah, yeah. Homes under the hammer. Oh, do you know what? I can't even watch anything on the television. It doesn't matter what it is. Sherlock Holmes series, I'm commentating to my wife in the background. Have you noticed what curtains they're using or the backdrop or so on and so forth? I start shots, looking at the polish. lighting. Yeah. yeah. How long does it stay on something? I end up what, boring myself shitless over a TV show, turning around and thinking, right, they stayed on that two seconds before they... And what are they using for cut-throughs? How do they use one room to the next to alter the shot and yeah. stuff like that? And thinking, I'm going to use that on my next thing. Well, okay, so that seems like a lot of effort, and if you don't mind me saying, mm. your videos are truly exceptional, and st I've learned so much from them. Oh, thank you. I, and I mean that. They, you they, they really are amazing. I'm not just saying that. <laughs> um, what has that done for your business? It's For Brand Simon, it's been great, um, and it's quite interesting that my chairman, when, whenever he's in my company, he'll say, oh, by the way, you came up in a dinner party the other day, Tell Simon Hawksley when you see him next. We love his videos, so I find it can't buy that, can you? You can't. But the, the the thing that's amazing is whether it's on Facebook or LinkedIn or Instagram or whatever social media it is. I find it interesting that a lot of people get obsessed about the amount of likes they get, and I'll look at mine and I think, okay, I've got sixteen likes, and I think that's kind because people, some people have like obsessions. They like everything, and but then I look at the traction and think. Actually, 16 likes. If I click on that, I can find out who the 16 is. What I can't work out, who the other 10,000 are. And when you, when you realise that you've got this 10,000 audience and then suddenly it's, it's, it's regular, you think, actually, people are now following just to see, well, wait, what's he up to next and what's he up to mm. next? And I think it means that as a, as a brand ambassador for Finding Country, it's really good. But as a self-brand, it's essential. And I think that if I go to see, a, uh, you know, any, any family that I, I, I consider to represent their property for sale or to represent them on, on their buyer journey, it also gives me a body of evidence to say, here's some social proofing. This is what I've done in the past, but this is also the reaction do the, to do it. Do the numbers screw you up when you have a bad numbers or are you just check it yeah, out? Yeah, absolutely. And it's a good thing and it's a bit like doing a curbside debrief when i was a young estate agent i used to go and do a market appraisal at a house and if i didn't get the business i'd sit in the car before i got to the office and say what did i say what didn't i say what should i have well, said it's not so you're not actually beating yourself up about it you're no, actually learning from it learning from it yeah because there's plenty of people that yeah, judge yeah, their yeah, their work yeah. by the number of likes exactly and that, but every now and then i there was um there was a there's a tv show on um, on, on one of the channels called The New Pope that George Jude Law did and the very start of that Jude Law thing is you've got Jude Law dressed as a Pope and he just walks it through a gallery and towards the end he winks at a camera and I can remember you and I I, I I did a similar thing in front of Sir Robert Mallory's house and you turned around initially and went Simon I really can't see where that's going and then about two days later you came back and said Joe is genius I, I couldn't get it out of my head. I don't know what it was, but I couldn't get it out of my head. And I like the idea that if you put stuff out that's slightly marmite, that some people go, Ooh. that's atrocious, or yeah. that's brilliant. At least I, was mad I don't back. care, because it's the Phineas Barnum thing that all news is good news, whether it's good or bad well, news, I, I was, they're I, talking about it. I've been doing some training this morning at Newman's, and I basically said to them, you can't be vanilla. You can't please all the people all no. the time. I'm not asking you to be halib ghost, chilli, hot ice cream but you've got to be a bit of a uh, neapolitan yeah you have and there's 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 a, there's a comment within that that says that if you actually look at the um the gig 
world that we're in at the moment, um, a lot of people set up these small companies and it's whether they're part-time jobs or whatever they do. And but in order for them to lift their head above the parapet and get noticed, some of them do quite shocking things. But effectively, it works for the demographic they're after. So who cares? And I was, you know, I was talking to a lady yesterday who's um, she was telling me about a tattooist. But this uh, this tattooist's idea of relaxation is she suspends herself on kneecaps through her, uh, on meat hooks through her kneecaps. And I thought, well, that's shocking. But if you see the size of her man base, it doesn't suit me. But she's never going to be called vanilla. And I, it, it's that sort of world that, that our industry is weak on. We do need to lift our heads above the parapet. We do need to back ourselves. And we do need to make as big a noise as we possibly can. One final thought with mm. regard to the mindset of people going down the self-employed route. Mm. Because you must have seen people come through this door who who weren't here three months, four months later. Yeah. What would you say to the people? Who okay, that, that's that's a good question. Self-employment is not for everybody. And I think the first thing that you've got to do is you've got to kind of work out where you are as far as your partnership or your family demographic is first. So if you've got fixed costs and you've got kids and so on and so forth, how good an agent are you genuinely? So if you know that you've got to buy at least three months from the get-go. So if you listed a property now and it doesn't go through, um, it's natural sales cycle for three months. I'd say uh, six months. Yeah, well, how are you going to live during a, a given time? So what, what have you got as a, 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 as a backup? That, that's the safety net first. The second thing is self-employment only really suits an entrepreneur, somebody that does have a great deal of self-belief, but also somebody that wants to actually build a brand around themselves. And if they've got those sort of merits it doesn't matter whether it's our industry or any industry that is a wise choice for me it's a simple choice because it's always been about work-life balance and i like the idea that in my mindset i can choose to take a day off i can choose to not work from an office and so on and so forth um i also am very mindful that with my audience if i exploited my self-employed status and decided to take as much time off. Every time a big sale went through, I take a month off. I'm unreliable to other clients in a pipeline. So another thing that's significant as a point of commitment is to turn around to my clients and involve them in that side of my journey. So I do, every house that I represented in 2019, I sold in 2019 and gave myself Christmas off, but not on their time, on my time. One final question. Mm. How happy are you at the moment? Delighted. I'm, I'm in just the best place imaginable. 2020, this next decade going forward, is super significant for me because 2020 becomes a time of reinvention. And I look at the world of prop tech and AI and what's happening for our industry now moving forward. And the most important thing any self-employed person can be, whether it's our industry or any other industry, is the capacity to A, reinvent yourself, but B, stay current and focus on your own development. And we, honestly, we couldn't be at a better place. Thank you very much. You're welcome, sir.